Okay, good afternoon everybody. You're all very welcome indeed to this afternoon's talk. My name is John O'Brennan from Maynooth University. Uh, I specialize in enlargement policy and I'm delighted to be able to chair this session and to welcome back to Dublin and back to the Institute, uh, Erwan Foray. Uh, just before we begin, before I introduce our guest speaker, just a note to switch off your mobile phones or put them to silent. Uh, we have got about an hour, and that includes uh, time for questions and answers. Um, the initial address is on the record, and the Q&A to follow is under Chatham House rules. Um, so with that, um, an introduction. Uh, Erwan, I think, needs little introduction uh, at a Dublin event. His career spanned four decades or so within the EU institutions where he served with great distinction as EU Special Representative and Head of Delegation uh, within the EU External Service, uh, very significantly in regard to today's talk in Macedonia, uh, where he spent the last five years or so uh, of his career. He has a special interest in and writes regularly about the really interesting developments in Macedonia. He's also served as the first uh, head of delegation in South Africa in 1994, as the first head of EC delegations in Mexico and Cuba in 1989, and currently uh, also works as senior research fellow at the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels. And he's written a number of recent excellent pieces, particularly his piece on January, which reflects on EU enlargement policy, where we are, where we might be, uh, and the really significant challenges that the EU faces in the Western Balkans. So with that, I'm very, very happy to turn over to Erwin. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you to all of you for coming uh, to uh, the IIEA today, and I appreciate uh, this invitation to speak on a topic which is not uh, often on uh, top of the agenda of people's minds and uh, less of the EU uh, leaders. But it's uh, an important topic nevertheless. The Western Balkans is a region where we're not used to good news. Uh, usually the news is uh, dominated by uh, whatever it comes by inter-ethnic tensions often fueled by uh, the nationalist rhetoric that is more reminiscent of the 1990s. Uh, there are often parliamentary boycotts, etc. So generally, it's not good news. So when good news happens, it's certainly something to celebrate. And there's no doubt that the agreement uh, reached between Greece and Macedonia on uh, the resolution of the name dispute, which had divided uh, the countries. Uh, neighboring countries for over 27 years, basically since the independence of Macedonia in 1992, was warmly received by everybody because it means that uh, this agreement, whereby Macedonia changes its name to the Republic of North Macedonia, will be able to pursue its foreign policy uh, objectives, which had been blocked uh, by Greece uh, over all those years. So the accession to NATO is already well underway. Uh, the uh, accession protocol has been ratified already by the Greek parliament and is in the process of ratification by 29 other uh, member uh, countries of, uh, of NATO. So Macedonia already has its seat at the table, although on a provisional basis. Accession to the EU is unfortunately not uh, as easy. And even if uh, the country fulfills uh, all uh, the reforms that are required uh, that have been set out very clearly in various EU documents, it is by no means uh, certain that the green light will be given for opening accession negotiations uh, at the next European Council uh, in June. So this is, of course, of concern because uh, it underlines that uh, even though there has been a very strong uh, emphasis by the European Union on the uh, maintaining the European perspective for the Western Balkans, 
very often we see a, a delaying process. There's no doubt that the mood in the EU on enlargement is not that great. There is a lot of ambivalence uh, among EU member states on the pace of reform, uh, on the pace of the enlargement process itself. Uh, and um, also we have seen that the enlargement debate has at times been hijacked by those who consider that it's uh, going to mean much more uh, immigration uh, into the uh, European Union, etc. As regards the Western Balkans, there's no doubt that the European Union uh, has taken the region for granted for many years. They felt that because uh, there was a European perspective, the reforms were underway, the, the region would take care of itself. But very unfortunately, uh, very late in the day, uh, the EU realized that all was not well in the Western Balkans. There was an upsurge of many, many uh, conflicts and political crises in 2017 in particular, which uh, brought the president of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, in his State of the Union address in September 2017 to say that uh, we must maintain a credible enlargement perspective for the Western Balkans. So this was followed by a, a very, very welcome document uh, issued by the European Commission in February 2018, the so-called strategy paper, which set out in very clear uh, language all that was wrong in the Western Balkans and set out a very, very detailed program of action. It also contained a very strong and, in my view, long overdue message addressed to the EU member states. And I quote where it emphasizes uh, that enhanced enlargement uh, was so important, underlining that merit-based prospect of EU membership for the Western Balkans is in the Union's very own political, security and economic interests. So we all had great hopes that 2018 would make a big difference in terms of the EU's re-engagement with the region. But sadly, Events have shown that this did not uh, happen. Uh, there was uh, the uh, summit in Sofia, the first summit, official summit of EU Western Balkan countries hosted by um, the uh, pres then presidency in Sofia in May, the first summit since 2003, since the uh, Thessaloniki summit of 2003. It marked time. It did not make any major uh, decisions, basically reaffirmed the European perspective for the Western Balkans, but nothing more. This was followed by the European Council in June, where it was expected that there would be a positive decision for the opening of negotiations with Macedonia and Albania, particularly since Macedonia had just two weeks before, on the 16th of June, signed the agreement with Greece in the expectation that, there would be a, uh, that this would be rewarded uh, by the uh, European Council. This did not happen. Uh, there was a clear, very strong, deep divisions within the EU member states which emerged between those who favored continued enlargement and those led in particular by President Macron who made very clear that for him Enlargement is only possible after the EU has sorted out its own internal problems. In other words, deepening versus enlargement debate, which had come up in the past before, uh, and which unfortunately in this particular case uh, is, has been very strongly uh, advocated once again. Will 2019 offer any new, uh, better perspectives? Well, this is unfortunately not guaranteed. Uh, we have a new institutional cycle, uh, the European Parliament elections, where the latest polls show that there will certainly be a rise of the uh, populist parties. The more established parties will narrow their uh, majorities, meaning the Social Democrats and the European People's Party. Uh, so what to expect of that? Probably uh, even more skepticism uh, on uh, issues relating to enlargement. I have to say that the European People's Party, which is the largest grouping at the moment, which should be a strong advocate for enlargement, has played a negative role, in my view, uh, in the Western Balkans, because it has supported and protected 
uh, leaders who have very clearly violated a lot of the fundamental values, the reforms, even when some of those leaders, such as the former Prime Minister of Macedonia, were under investigations for criminal activities. And yet the EPP continued to support them. In fact, the EPP didn't even officially welcome the uh, agreement signed between Greece and Macedonia, because in its membership there is the New Democracy Party, uh, which of course expressed a lot of uh, antipathy to that agreement. But it's just to show you that, in my view, this is uh, unfortunate, and it shows that the difficulties of finding consensus within the European Parliament on, on, on enlargement. There will, of course, be a new uh, president of the Commission that will take up office in November, a new high representative, and a new president of the European Council. And also, uh, we have seen the latest Eurobarometer uh, of last year, where for the first time a support for enlargement among those polled was uh, slightly negative, 46% uh, against uh, and 44% in favour of continued enlargement. So in the public the mood is also uh, ambivalent. But meanwhile, while this is going on, the socio-economic climate in the Balkan region is extremely alarming. If you look at one of the most recent Western Bol um, uh, World Bank report, it indicates that the economies of the Western Balkans will need to grow at the annual rates of at least 6% if they are to match the EU average by the end of the t of 2030. Uh, 2030. There is economic growth. It's an averaging about 3.5% last year, which is a credible one, but unfortunately it's not uh, job creating. So there's a lot of structural problems, a lot of unemployment. Uh, in some countries it's over 25%, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and of those over 50% are youth unemployment. And, and then the World Bank also had a very uh, revealing statistic in addition to the fact that poverty levels are 20 23% overall, 60% of women uh, in the Western Balkans are unemployed. So it shows the huge economic, socio-economic issues that uh, are prevalent there. This is uh, compounded by the, the political problems. If you look at the uh, newspapers, you may have seen in the last week that there has been demonstrations, parliamentary boycotts in Albania, in Bosnia, in Serbia, in Macedonia also, <coughs> even though there's a new government there. So the, the political climate is still very, very fragile. The institutions, uh, the checks and balances that we take for granted are still very weak in, in many of these countries. Political dialogue is not something which is automatic it's basically the winner takes all. I'm not saying this is particular to the Western Balkans. We have it also in other countries. But in the Western Balkans, this approach to politics has a much more serious impact because of the weak uh, uh, institutions. So then we have, of course, a lot of bilateral disputes that are still ongoing. I mentioned the, uh, the PRESPA agreement, which is a very positive development between Greece and Macedonia. You have the Serbia-Kosovo dialogue, which was initiated um, by uh, Catherine Ashton, the former high representative, and continued by the current high representative, but it has not gone anywhere, unfortunately. And Kosovo, which was extremely disappointed that it did not get the visa liberalization that had been promised by the European Union, uh, in desperation, they imposed last year 100% tariffs on all the goods coming from Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina, and this has raised uh, a, a, very, a lot of difficulties for the Serbia-Kosovo dialogue. In, in this particular context of this uh, particular dispute, there has been also the suggestion mooted by the respective presidents uh, from Kosovo and Serbia about a border correction or land swap. In other words, the northern part of Kosovo, north of Mitrovica, which has about roughly 60,000 uh, population, majority Serbian, would be exchanged for the southern part of Serbia, 
roughly 50, 55,000 majority Albanian in the Preshevo Valley. This border correction or border swap has been on the table now for several months. Uh, it has been roundly rejected by all the other political parties in Kosovo and in Serbia, as well as by civil society, saying that it goes totally against all that uh, the international community has stood for, uh, this sort of mono-ethnic uh, approach. The EU has been quite ambivalent. The only person who really spoke out very strongly against this was, was Chancellor Merkel, who said that border corrections in the context of the Western Balkans is a very serious uh, and dangerous precedent. And of course, we all know that it could open up the, the proverbial uh, Pandora's box because there are other countries who would like their borders corrected. Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, linked with Serbia, etc. So it's a very, very uh, dangerous issue and it still uh, has not yet uh, been uh, rejected uh, out, out of hand. So I, my feeling on border disputes, because the, there the EU has been very clear. It said that it will not import any uh, border disputes, in other words, any country that has not resolved its, its uh, bilateral problems or disputes with its neighbours will not be allowed into the European Union. Of course, it's understandable so as not to have another Cyprus. But uh, I don't think that the region, even uh, the uh, Greek Macedonia example notwithstanding, I don't think that they can do this on their own. There needs to be some sort of mechanism, and what I had proposed uh, is that uh, after the breakup of Yugoslavia, there was the Badanter Commission, which uh, addressed many, many of the issues post-Yugoslavia, and that perhaps there should be some sort of similar uh, approach uh, in dealing with all the bilateral disputes that are still uh, ongoing. So in the next months, we have uh, a number of uh, important deadlines. Uh, I mentioned the European Parliament elections. On the 9th of May, there's the Sibiu uh, uh, summit, um, which is supposed to be a summit where the new strategic goals post-Brexit will be adopted. Uh, let's hope uh, that will be the case. There was a, a suggestion that the Western Balkans would be allowed to attend this meeting, but now this is not yet, from my understanding, confirmed. In June, we have the European Council, uh, which is supposed to take important decisions which were postponed from last year. And I think here, uh, the European Union will have a critical choice. Either it follows uh, the commitment towards enlargement, gives the green light for Macedonia and Albania, uh, if they have fulfilled all the criteria in terms of Macedonia. This certainly, uh, in my view, is the case. Albania, there's still a, a number of issues regarding the judicial reforms, but nevertheless, uh, quite a lot of, of work has, has been done. Or the EU follows the Macron approach, which is another uh, postponement. The danger of that, there are many dangers. First of all, demotivation in the Western Balkans. Uh, and also other actors, as, uh, as um, Juncker himself very clearly said in his last State of the Union address in September 2018, if the EU is not united in the Western Balkans, others will shape developments. And we all know and we have seen the very, very aggressive approach of Russia in the last years in the Western Balkans, <coughs> its involvement, alleged involvement in the attempted coup in Montenegro, uh, and also its interference in the um, discussions and negotiations on the name issue, uh, name negotiations where, which resulted in Athens expelling two uh, Russian diplomats, something which was unheard of in Greece because of their always very close relationship uh, with, with Moscow. Um, and of course, it's, it's interesting because 70% roughly of trade from the Western Balkans goes to the EU. So the economic interest is not there, but it's very much the strategic political interest of Russia to have a very strong uh, role, strong influence in the Western Balkans. China is another important actor which has invested heavily in the region, 
with the exception of Kosovo, all the Western Balkan countries are embedded in this so-called One Belt, One Road initiative, which has meant a, a lot of infrastructure financed by Greece, but under loans which uh, are tying the Western Balkans for many years to come. For example, Montenegro, 39% of its external debt is debt owed to China. The comparable figure for the others is in Macedonia, 20%, Bosnia and Herzegovina, 14%, Serbia, 12%. And the third important uh, uh, other actor is Turkey, of course, which has its other uh, influences which it has uh, brought to bear uh, in the region. So this is uh, the, uh, the danger, in my view, of the Macron approach if this is followed. And if it is followed, it will re-emphasize the critical importance of the so-called Berlin process. I think you're all aware uh, of the initiative from Chancellor Merkel in July 2014, where she launched this process of coming closer to the Western Balkans as a way of commemorating the 100 years since the First World War. Uh, she hosted the first meeting in 2014. The next one was in Vienna 2015. After that, Paris 2016. Trieste 2017, um, London 2018, unfortunately on the very day when Boris Johnson decided to resign. So he had all these uh, heads of state, but he didn't appear. Uh, and uh, now in next July, it will be in Poznan, hosted by uh, Poland. And this process has been important in a sense because it has strengthened the uh, connectivity agenda. Uh, strengthening the energy connectivity, transport connectivity between the different countries because that is still uh, uh, lacking in, in many respects. So Berlin process will remain uh, important. So my uh, hope for uh, this coming year and for the EU's re-engagement is that there must be uh, credibility restored in the EU's enlargement uh, agenda, in the policy towards the Western Balkans. I'm focusing on the Western Balkans, which together constitute 18 million people. It's a drop in the ocean for the European Union. I would hope that this year we'll see the start of accession negotiations with Macedonia Albania. I'm not so sure that this will happen for Albania because there's still a lot of prejudices regarding uh, Albania, but we have to see. The important thing is that encouragement is given. A candidate status for Bosnia and Herzegovina would be an important uh, encouragement for them to continue uh, in the process of, of reforms. But beyond that, I do believe that there needs to be a change of strategy from the European Union in how it deals with the Western Balkans. It should not confine its debates and dialogue with the elite, with the political establishment, who are so deeply entrenched. And this unfortunately perpetuates the, the Balkan strongman syndrome, as we see in Serbia with President Vucic. Uh, and also, uh, it does not give uh, sufficient space to civil society, which in many of these countries fill the gap left by the check, lacks of checks and balances. It's civil society that can ensure much greater accountability uh, by the governments. And I, I feel that there needs to be from the EU a much greater focus on uh, the uh, civil society participation. And finally, the EU also needs to focus much more on the societal issues, the deep, long-standing problems linked to education, to promote this multi-ethnic uh, education, multicultural environment, on reconciliation, uh, which is a major problem uh, in, uh, in the region. When you consider that in the old Yugoslavia, uh, people knew each other. I mean, the military service, the soldiers from Slovenia would be posted to Macedonia, vice versa. The younger, so the parents of the current young generation understood their neighbors. The young generation today don't know their neighbors. In some, they have to get visas to go from one country to another. So there needs to be much greater focus on the younger generation, how to 
to create this uh, atmosphere uh, of um, reconciliation throughout the region. Uh, and I think the EU has a critical role to play in ensuring that this happens. It's, after all, Europe's nearest neighborhood. And on that hopeful note, I end my presentation. Thank you.